My name is Gerd Leonhardt. I work as a futurist. I run a company called The Futures Agency. And I'm really happy to have today some really, really interesting people with me. Guys, come on up on stage here. Some really great people. A futurist, an uh, entrepreneur and tech innovator from, uh, from Kenya, um, in telecom media, futurist expert, and a person that's dealing with in innovation in the biogenetics uh, uh, Bioinformation Center, sorry, Rachel. So they'll be making an introduction shortly. The, what the format of this event is going to be about uh, five minute presentations from each person. And then we have what we call a grilling session, which means that you can ask questions, any tough questions, through Twitter. Uh, I have a Twitter feed here. The Twitter hashtag is, of course, uh, hashtag ITUworld113, third day today. Uh, if you want to tweet a question, you can do that using this hashtag. Uh, and I will try to answer the question in the, throughout the conversation. We're also going to have uh, questions to each other, and afterwards, after the first round, we have a 20-minute question and answer session and also a short poll to give you. So uh, let's dive right in, and of course, me being the keynote speaker and the moderator, I get to go first. <laughs> so I'm gonna have a presentation. Let's start with my first presentation, okay. Thank you. Put up the slides if you can. Okay, so basically the whole topic of the session is what's, what's happening in a network society. Uh, and my view is in a network society, there's two things that are starting to matter. One is that we're going from this idea of companies being networks rather than a network, like from NBC to YouTube, right? So companies are becoming networked. Also the empowerment of users, as you can see here with the fish, uh, this idea of saying that the use of the individual actually is starting to matter more than ever before, right, in a network society. And I think this is really quite hard, as you can, as you can see in this slide here, is that uh, uh, on a global level, we have this shift towards people having more empowerment through mobile devices and social media. For example, you can see the big uh, change in RIM in the business of BlackBerry, right, the consumerization of IT, is that all of a sudden people are using Blackberries a lot more than businesses. Uh, which is a huge shift for BlackBerry, and of course one of the major problems of their, and issues of their decline. So technology means empowerment, right, and, and a lot more than empowerment. As you can see here in the Arab Spring, as the CEO of Salesforce.com has said, it's not just about the Arab Spring, it's about the corporate spring, right? Companies are changing, businesses are changing, is the way that we communicate. Most global, uh, global Fortune 100 companies have strong involvement on social networks which is actually quite difficult because as a big company, you're not really set up to involve or co have conversations that easily, especially if, if you're a bank, for example, or insurance companies. Now companies are becoming what I call uh, going from the empire to networks. There's a great movie that just came out from uh, Tiffany Schlein called uh, uh, Connected, the movie, that you should watch. It, it explains how companies are becoming networks, and this is, of course, a slide of Facebook, Facebook nearing one billion users. Uh, Facebook is the biggest country in the world very soon, just surpassed by China and I think India at this point. Uh, so very interesting companies are becoming companies where co-creation is the new sort of standard. Co-creation meaning that you outsource ideas. And uh, Juliana from Ushahidi will talk about what she's doing later. But crowdsourcing ideas, BMW is looking for designs on the internet, uh, many pharma companies are putting out uh, ideas for the creation of new medication into public domain using sites like uh, crowdsourcing mechanisms and so on. So co-creation is becoming sort of a new default, which runs against the idea of intellectual property and who owns what and those kind of things. Also very importantly, I do a lot of work in Brazil, Russia, uh, and other places like Indonesia. Clearly the future will be shaped in those countries. Uh, here in Europe, of course, we do have a crisis, uh, not just in Europe, but also other places. But basically, if we're looking at Brazil, Russia, China, that's where the future will be happening. And mobile phones are the tools of empowerment for consumers there. You can see, for example, that airtime is becoming a currency in many of those countries. You can trade airtime. We also have total convergence, uh, meaning that we no longer know what's online and offline. Uh, many people, for example, if you go to a clothes store today, you can tweet the dress that you're wearing and ask your friends for opinions. I mean, this is already reality, right? So we don't really know what's online and offline any longer. It's complete convergence. And basically, being offline is becoming a luxury. That is the new luxury, right? So if you're really rich, you're going to be offline because you have somebody else being online for you. Right? 
That goes for our kids. You know, our kids are growing up being people of the screen. Uh, this is a quote from Kevin Kelly, who says that no longer are we people of the book, we're people of the screen. Right? And this is true. I mean, there are screens everywhere, in the car, in the airport, in the airplane, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, and uh, very soon you can watch your recipes scroll by as you cook, right? I mean, people of the screen, and they consume entirely different, as you can see, for example, in the demise of the music business, 71% decline because of this kind of consumption. Uh, a point that uh, Simon will drive home in the next session, next five minutes, is that data is becoming the new oil. And I didn't make this up. It was uh, made up six or seven years ago by the American Marketing Association and by the European Commission, saying that basically what's happening is that the value of the data that we create is becoming so powerful that it will rival oil as a driving force. Right? Data companies, Google right, is a master of data mining, Facebook, companies like that. And basically, we are shifting now in our world to what uh, Jeff Jarvis calls publicy. We're going from a world to where everybody that's doing anything in business is becoming somewhat a public person. I mean, everybody in this room is probably on LinkedIn or Facebook or LinkedIn, Zing, or <laughs> Zing or Twitter or so, right? We're becoming public by default, which is very scary. At the same time, has various benefits that we're going to discuss in our session. I think there's a significant amount of uh, issues that will come here. So as you can see, my time has been cut off. So I'm going to take questions from the audience and from my colleagues here. Uh, is there any urgent uh, question in the audience? Is there a tweet, somebody with a concern, anyone? Anyone? No? Then we start with my colleagues. Fire away if you have a question or a objection. Dare you. you. You talked about the idea of data being the new oil. Do you want to just expand on that a little bit more and talk about what that might mean to the people in the room, the businesses they have? Yeah, I'll only make this very brief because uh, Simon's session is about this very issue in the next five minutes. But basically, the very fact that we're all generating data now, we're saying where we are, what we like, what we rate, uh, we give the thumbs up, we do the like button, all these things, right, basically becomes a huge flow of information that is very valuable for companies. This is one reason that Facebook will do probably the biggest IPO ever, right, because they have really powerful data about their users. And that data can be used to sell things or to market things, which is a $1 trillion economy. The telcos, of course, have data that they really haven't used much. And Simon will talk about that. So basically, that issue is a very, very big issue. And I think, in fact, there are wars fought over data. As you can see on the, in, on the internet, data is, is a real source of uh, good things and bad things, which we'll hope to talk about. Other questions? Let me see if there's any tweet here. Any of you? And um, what are the implications for intellectual property with a networked, open, um, interconnected future? Very good question. <laughs> Thanks for throwing that ball to me. I, I think basically what's happening is that uh, ownership is less important than access now. For example, if you can see what's happening in the music business, right? do we still need to own the record? It's enough if, if we can just click a button and listen to the music. right? So copyright is still very important and, of course, is crucial to a lot of things. But the way you monetize is not by selling a copy. Right? The way you monetize is by providing access. Uh, the most successful service in the, in the movie business until yesterday, <laughs> when their stock plunged, was Netflix. Uh, 22 million subscribers paying $10 for access. But would they buy a DVD? Maybe not. Right? So I think what's happening with the idea of intellectual property and copyright is that we're going to see new embodiments of allowing people to use what we have, right? rather than keeping it back. Other question? Yeah, one thing. Um, should we try and fight against being too, many, too much people of the screen? Is it bad for us? And do we need some help in get coming off this drug? Very good point. I, I didn't get to that point, but I think uh, we're going to see a lot of movement towards what I call a digital detox, right? which basically means that we're going offline to recuperate from the river of information. Right? So part of that thing is going to be uh, that essentially these tools are so cool and so new now, you know, iPhones, iPads, uh, uh, Android and so on, that everybody's using it. It's a bit like a toy. I think in five or 10 years, it, it becomes reality like, like uh, tap water or like electricity, right? And then we'll mellow down, I think, in the abuse of this, right? But clearly, there are significant issues about addiction and, and all these kind of things that we're going to have to face, right? But let me remind you of one important fact, of course. Television didn't fare any better, right? I mean, people are truly addicted to television 
and it's truly bad, right? So compared to that, the internet is still doing pretty good. <laughs> Uh, there's a question from Twitter. Um, mobile phones are the tools of empowerment for consumers. What about telecenters? I don't know the answer to that. That's a very good question. The telecenters don't seem to be the tool of empowerment, but um, maybe we can reserve that question for later and see if we can answer it. Do we have another question? How do we end users benefit from their data if it is not the new oil? Very good question. Anybody want to answer? Well, they can't. I mean, a lot of the le legislation at the moment is essentially pushing no data to be recorded and no data to be kept. So you get into a very bad situation within certain directions that law might go in. So we, I'll come on to that in a second. Yeah, I think one of the key issues about data is I think telecoms and operators and ISPs have to be much more proactive about how to use that data, how to mine it, what to be permitted, what they do with it, how they collect it, how they use APIs. We're going to talk about APIs later. I think uh, open APIs are crucial to the process of the overall ecosystem, which uh, Juliana will talk 